Good afternoon. When I hear phrases like, I have 18 years of experience, I'm reminded of the fact that some of the interns who come to work for me are 19. And I worry a little bit when I've been working longer than they've been alive. But it's something I'm increasingly just going to have to get over. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I want to talk to you about how the effort and the, um, the focus of design changes as we change our attention from the very small, the minute details of our design work up to large scale type activities. Um, very quickly, Melt Studios, which is the design studio that I, I'm, I, I founded and, and run, deals with design challenges right across this broad spectrum. I don't really want to talk about us, but just for context, we deal with things like how governments deliver education in my home state of New South Wales. I'll talk briefly about an example of some work we did helping our government redesign the way prisoners get moved around our justice system, as an example. We work with libraries, universities, a whole range of things. Um, but in doing that, what we need to worry about changes very, very much from these small details through to these very large systems. We can't use the same tools and techniques, even though our philosophy remains the same throughout. So, when I talk about designing at different scales and thinking about these sort of broader contexts, what I don't want to give the impression of is that details are not important or not as important as operating at scale. The idea that doing strategic design work is somehow harder or more important um, is a false one. You cannot deliver any kind of system unless you are sweating the details. They always need to be dealt with sooner or later. They are extremely important. So I want to get that one out of the way straight up, just so you understand that I'm not dismissing the importance of detailed design work. So I want to talk about a few different uh, levels, if you like, of design and design focus. The first of these just deals with some of the very, very small details that exist right at what I think of as the plane of interaction, the thing that you touch, the things that you click on. They're these micro-interactions, to use a phrase that Dan Saffer has written about in his book, Micro-Interactions. They are the thing that you you know, the drop down or the radio button or the mouse click or the drag, those small interactions. Um, when we're dealing with those things, we're dealing very much with low level interaction design, low level usability, um, very sort of simple control response type mechanisms. And as Dan says, there's a lot of the difference when we think about products and services that we love versus ones that we tolerate, quite often the thing that we love about it is a small thing. It's something tiny. But it's something that demonstrates to us that someone put thought and care and attention into a minor detail. And they thought about it and got it just right. There's something like this, Facebook's like button is a great example of a very successful micro-interaction. It's a single click, it does a single thing. But it's changed the way that we interact, not only with our own content, but with other people through the largest social network on the planet, um, fundamentally shifted the way in which we engage with other people. Now, it's a good example of just that micro-interaction. It has a single, small function. If I broaden that perspective out, though, and start to think about, well, what happens on the screen? What happens on the page? What's the function or the activity or the task that I'm trying to achieve? What we start to realize is that we're no longer so much focused on how I'm interacting with the screen. I'm starting to design how I interact with other people how I interact with organizations, how I interact with services. It's no longer about pressing buttons or entering text or selecting options or playing a game even. It's about how technology mediates my response with other people. Now, um, 
that one. Hang on. There we go. So uh, John Colco, who's an author uh, and designer who lives and works in Austin, Texas, wrote a book uh, uh, several years ago called Thoughts on Interaction Design, and in it he made this point, that interaction design is the design of a dialogue. It's a dialogue between a person and other people, or an object, or a system, or a service, or an organization. But it's not about the design of a thing. It's about the design of how I mediate and how that technology mediates my relationship with others. And it's an interesting way to think about it, because when you do, you realize that what we're designing doesn't stop on the phone or the laptop or the tablet. That thing is a window through which a person engages with the world. So when we look beyond that plane and we start to think about those things, we start to think more about the context of use. We start to think more about where that person might be engaging and who they're trying to engage with. We worry much more about heuristics and their sense of identity. We think about things like religion and socioeconomic status. Are they wealthy or are they poor? Because in understanding those things, we're better able to understand what they're trying to get from that interaction. It's no longer about interaction design or information architecture solely. It's about how those things build. Twitter is an example. If you think about the use of hashtags, they are, and we're using them here today, the hashtag that each of you use aggregates up to a conversation about this conference. It's a way for you to post messages that other people might read. It's a way for you to post comments that the organizers might see later and use as feedback. It's your method of communication. It's not just for you. And it's not you integrating or interacting with Twitter either. Using these mechanisms, we are quite deliberately interacting with other people. Uber's payment feature is another good example of how we sort of think about a broad system. The design of their payment feature was a way to introduce anonymity into a, and, and security of my data and my financial information into an environment within which two strangers need to conduct business. So the Uber driver is a stranger to the passenger. But how do I pay for that? using a credit card, well, what they've done is taken the visibility and the accessibility of that credit card and put it in the cloud, and they mediate the payment. But they've thought about that from the perspective of what am I concerned about and how do I interact with the driver in this case. We can broaden that out even further. So I've spoken about two of these levels of, of design. If I start to think about that third level, we start to think more around what I think of as a closed systems. We're talking about an end-to-end -end service that has multiple components to it, product and service ecosystems working together. It's not just the design of a single thing, even a, a, a closely sort of a controlled thing. Rather than thinking about signs and signage or structure, we might think about wayfinding as an example. Um, if I think about transportation and the use of bicycles, and Istanbul um, doesn't have cycling in the same way that I'm used to in Australia, for example. Um, in a city like Sydney, you would see dedicated cycleways and signage for bicycles, not on the scale that you might see in Amsterdam or Copenhagen, but certainly more than I've seen here. But cycling and bicycle riding is a closed system in that we're just focused on one mode of transport. It's still focused on activities, and it's starting to look at broader group dynamics. What happens when people behave on aggregate? Paul's example earlier, where he was looking at the overall pattern of a citywide use, where people are walking and how many at different times of the day in different cities, and is an example of how that bubbles up. The iPod came out, and it's probably one of the first best examples of a product service ecosystem. It's contained in the sense that I have a device and an iTunes library and then my music, 
but it's quite large in terms of the number of people and the amount of music that came with it. Now, that exploded when we introduced the concept of the iPhone and the App Store and the app ecosystem that came with it. Suddenly, there was a whole lot more that happened on that platform. But this was probably the first major example of a product service ecosystem in what I think of as contemporary design and contemporary uh, consumer electronics. We can go one step further. And we start to look at open systems, systems of integrated and interacting ecosystems of things. And I start to think about whole economies. I start to think about society as a whole. I start to think about policy, public policy, politics, planning. We start to think about how a whole cityscape is transformed. How do we design for a city to be walkable? How do we design for a city to be more livable? How do we design our political systems or our economic systems to make them more user-centered? Australia has just released its federal budget. The federal budget is the mechanism by which our government tells us what they're going to spend our tax money on. It is an example of a large-scale design problem. And in each of these, the line items in the budget, we're determining our tax, our rates of taxation, what money is going to be spent on public health, what money will be spent on public education, what money will be spent on our military and our defence, those sorts of things. Large, broad-scale design. Um, it's been probably one of the least contentious budgets that we've had in our current government. Um, following two years of great controversy. Um, there's at least one other Australian in the room who will agree with me that our current climate of government is not quite what it could be in Australia. To all, I'm gonna talk about politics today, um, lest I go way over time. What we need, though, is when we think about these large-scale issues, um, these are still design challenges. The role of a designer is still present in a large-scale exercise like a national economy and a national federal budget. But we can't approach it in the same way that we do an interface. We can approach it with the same mindset, we can approach it with the same philosophy, but we can't use the same tools. It's hard to do usability testing on a federal budget. I wish they would test it but you can't use those same tools. Can you prototype a federal budget? Could you run a pilot? Could you iterate? Is there such a thing as a minimum viable product for a national economy? The tools of design need to scale in the same way that the object of design scales. And this is one of those areas where we are still coming to terms with how design plays a role at these large scales, but it can. The challenge that we've got is that it's hard to broaden our perspective beyond the national scale. We struggle, and you can see it at the moment in our debates around climate change, we struggle to broaden our perspective to think on a global scale. Our minds struggle with it. But if we can't broaden our perspective outside of the dimensions of the problem we're trying to solve, it's very difficult to solve that problem. Now, one of the things is that, as designers, we are constantly having to shift our focus. We are constantly having to broaden our perspective to gain context, and we then have to dive into details to make it clear to others what it is we intend. How will the thing work? Give me specific details. And then zoom back out again to ensure that the low-level interactions we're putting in place, those small details, haven't messed up our broad scheme. The best designers move fluidly between these, between these scales. The best designers constantly shift their focus between detail and broad vision without getting lost with the thing that they're trying to design in the first place.
there are a few signs that say that a team is not well aligned on scale, that you're not operating at the same scale of design as the rest of your team or your client or the business in which, within which you work. These are some examples of phrases. People say, oh, you're too in the weeds. That's like too much detail. Take a big picture view. And others will say, well, that's, you're in the clouds. We need, we need more structure. We need to think more specifically. Give me a concrete example of something. Now, the challenge that we have is that when we put together a team of people and try and work on a problem where we are shifting across these scales of endeavor and changing our focus across these scales, if we're not aligned on scale, if we're not aligned on the level of detail and, and context, we can run into big problems. It can also work really well when we are. So I want to talk about uh, two examples, one that worked well, one that worked not so well. This is the one that worked not so well. Um, we did a project for a media company where we thought we were asked to do a vision piece, a strategy for how people engage with media. Now, that was basically the definition of our problem space. How do people engage with media? And so the way in which we were going about our research and the questions that we were asking felt appropriate to us, and yet our client kept asking for more specific questions. They wanted us to drill in deeper and get into specifics. And that didn't flag for us, unfortunately, until much further on, the fact that we weren't aligned on the scale at which we should be designing. We thought we were operating at this sort of broad strategic level. They wanted us to be looking at details around specific examples, apps and details. And so we constantly had tension throughout the project. We ended up as a dysfunctional group. The project was stopped. The client said, no more, and we said, no more. It was a failure complete abject failure as a project because we weren't operating at the same scale. They wanted much more detail and we were trying to stay in that sort of strategic realm. We had another example though that worked much better. We did a piece of work for, the, for our state government in New South Wales around how prisoners get moved around the justice system from the moment they're arrested until they appear in court. Um, they can be moved a number of times, they see a magistrate, they see the police, they see a lawyer, all of these sort of different movements. But the more we looked at that problem and started to look at the context within which that problem sat, we realised that what we needed to be doing was thinking about how the justice system as a whole could change. And we went back to the client and said, we think the scale at which we're operating needs to broaden. And they agreed. And so we were able to redefine our project and redefine the design work that we were doing to try and resolve a systemic issue rather than the specifics of person gets moved from here to here and what's that like for them. So the end result was a much stronger piece of design work because we were able to agree on the appropriate scale at which our design work was happening. That is all I wanted to say for you today. To recap, the, the main point that I want you to take away, though, is that we cannot escape detail. We cannot escape trying to understand context. As designers, we need to move fluidly between detail and broad context. When we can not get lost along the way and when we can remain aligned with the rest of our team, we end up doing much better work. For us, it doesn't always work that way, but when it does, it works really well. That's it for me. Thank you. I recognize that I stand between you and lunch. So with that said, I think I might have time for one question. And I've just set whoever wants to ask that question up to keep everyone back from lunch. I think I'll say thank you and let you go, but thank you for coming.